Well, comrade chairman and comrades, uh, first of all, uh, I want to uh, convey the greetings and uh, gratitude of the comrades working in Pakistan. for uh, continuous support and uh, inspiration we have from uh, the IMT and the international. And uh, obviously in the conditions we are working in a country like Pakistan, it would simply not have been possible without the support and uh, without the moral backing of uh, the international and the international secretariat. Now, Pakistan is probably uh, the most notorious country in the world. What it is famous for? Terrorism, fundamentalism, drug smuggling, crime, corruption, and every other uh, vice you can think of. And that is not all false. But uh, we have also to understand that uh, what the media and the international bourgeoisie and the inter intelligentsia uh, don't understand or don't uh, expose or don't talk about is the enormous potential of the workers and youth in Pakistan to fight for a revolutionary change. <coughs> such are the conditions in Pakistan that if there is no news of a bomb blast, of a suicide bombing, of people being killed in different terrorist attacks. Uh, it, it looks like an abnormal day, an extraordinary day. At this moment in time, there are four major proxy wars going on in Pakistan. There's bloodshed and mayhem in Balochistan, where every day there are killings of the Hazaras and the Shias and other ethnic minorities. The nationalist youth that are struggling against the national oppression in Balochistan are being regularly picked up, kidnapped, mutilated, uh, tortured, and their mutilated bodies are thrown away every day. It's a daily routine. <laughs> now that uh, proxy war is being fought between the Chinese imperialism and the American imperialism. Uh, Pakistan army has its uh, biggest arms <coughs> supplies, not from the United States, not from the West, but from China, ever since 1962. And Chinese have major investments in Pakistan, and the character of the Chinese relationship with Pakistan also changed with the the regime change and the restoration of capitalism after 1978 in China. Uh, now China has got five major civilian and military ports in the Indian Ocean. Uh, 
It is a developing a port in Bangladesh, one in Maldives, one in uh, Sri Lanka, and two in Pakistan. And this port, known as the Gawadar port, is uh, on the mouth of the Gulf of, of Hormuz, from where 40 percent of oil supplies uh, pass through Pakistan, or uh, through, through that uh, sea route. <coughs> and this uh, port is in Balochistan, the Pakistan's largest, the poorest, and minerally the richest province uh, of the country. And uh, the Chinese have uh, investments in mining in Balochistan. They have uh, taken over the gold mines, the copper mines, the bauxite mines, and other mineral resources in that area. And uh, the Americans, uh, as they always do, use the national question and especially the oppressed nationalities uh, for their own uh, interests and they're supporting the oppressed Baloch nationalists who were previously pro-Moscow Stalinists uh, to fight against uh, this uh, Chinese intervention and hegemony in that region. At the same time, the uh, reactionary Saudi monarchy uh, and the Iranian uh, mullah aristocracy have also their uh, mineral and strategic interests in Balochistan and areas of Pakistan. And uh, they are using uh, the religious card or the religious issue, uh, the sectarian conflict, uh, to uh, to comply for their interests. <coughs> the Shia minority in uh, uh, known as the Hazaras, who are actually descendants of the Mongols have traveled all the way from Mongolia to Central Asia to Afghanistan and ended up in Balochistan, are being viciously killed by Islamic fundamentalist Wahhabi outfits supported, financed and armed by the Saudi Arabian monarchy. And uh, it's almost uh, a conflict where the Hazaras are being uh, cleansed, actually. They're, being, uh, they're a small minority, and still hundreds and hundreds of them are being killed, perhaps to totally eliminate them from that region. And uh, the intelligence agencies, they pick up uh, uh, people, they torture them, they kill them, and there's nobody, no democracy, no parliament that can do anything about it. And uh, where uh, everything else has collapsed, it's really sometimes surprising, pleasantly surprising, that our strongest, the most organized, the most disciplined region or section of the organization is in Balochistan with 289 comrades there. <laughs> 
vamos a ver eh, la función más organizada, más desempeñada, más reconociendo las elecciones pakistanes, la organización de la organización de los compañeros. Y about uh, Five comrades have been killed in the last period. And uh, they are under constant threat of uh, being picked up by the intelligence agencies, killed, mutilated, threatened. But uh, such is the determination and the will that uh, and that's also because of the ideas of this international that this tyranny and this uh, coercion and torture really cannot be solved without uh, a total transformation of the system through a socialist revolution. <coughs> There's no respite at any time in this system that anything can improve in that bloodshed and mayhem and conflagration that's going on in Baluchistan. Then uh, we have the other war going on, the so-called war against terror in Waziristan, in the, uh, in the tribal areas, in Pashtun and in Sabat. Just uh, in the last uh, three months, 967 children have been killed through the drone strikes of U.S. imperialism. And uh, this uh, continu the drone strikes, these predator uh, aircraft who fire missiles, those missiles are called hellfire missiles. And they mostly target innocents and all of this propaganda about precision and technology advancement and whatever. What we see is that very few real terrorists are killed. Most of the people are killed are women, children, and ordinary innocent humans. Sawat <coughs> uh, is uh, known as uh, the northern Switzerland of uh, Pakistan. It is a serene beauty with mountains, uh, with pine and fir trees, and it, with uh, flowing rivers and spring, and it's really a very beautiful area. And that was taken over uh, by the Taliban in agreement with the democratic government of the PPP in 2009. <coughs> and there they imposed a Sharia law, which is, a, which is in a way a certain uh, Islamic fundamentalist uh, fascism. And uh, most uh, so-called liberal and democratic and secular politicians, they fled from Sabat. <laughs> Leaders of the PPP, the nationalists and others, they just uh, went down to Islamabad, the capital, and stayed there and abandoned the people to the mercy of these merciless uh, Islamic fundamentalists. <coughs> and uh, they had a radio station 
where uh, they used to announce fatwas for death to those people who were uh, resisting them. And there were two comrades of our organization, leading comrades, who, who were announced by that Taliban leader on their radio that uh, they should be eliminated. But our comrades didn't flee Sawat, they remained in Sawat. <coughs> they knew that the, there was a, a artificial conflict between the army and the Taliban. In the daytime, they used to fight each other, the, the army and Taliban, and the night they used to trade weapons with each other. And uh, the comrades had no illusions nor any expectation from the army and the state to come to the help of the uh, people in general who were suffering uh, from this uh, conflict. But the only force, the power, the weapon the comrades have had against the repression of the army and the brutalities of the Taliban was to mobilize the youth and the people of the area and by setting up revolutionary, uh, revolutionary camps for the refugees who were being displaced by the war. And because of their mass support, the comrades were able to not just uh, uh, to defend themselves, but also develop politically and gain the support of the population in general. And those camps and those remote areas were used not just to, uh, to help uh, the refugees with food, with education, with uh, sports, with recreation, with uh, other facilities, but also there are regular uh, classes of different uh, political ideas being discussed and those camps had regular Marxist study circles where a whole new layer of youth was developed uh, for uh, the organization and uh, several hundred were recruited to the organization. But the similar situation in Pakistan, it's uh, every day there are about uh, average 15 to 20 people are killed in Karachi in different ethnic and uh, uh, communal, communal violence. There's no city or place which uh, safe in Pakistan, the bombing, suicide attacks, which is a routine of life in that country. <coughs> and uh, the Pakistani economy is in shambles. In uh, 1978, Pakistan's total economy comprised of 5% of informal of bl or black economy. Now, the informal economy is about 76% of the total economy. And this uh, black economy is a product of the failure of uh, normal capitalist economy to develop further.
this uh, informal economy has uh, a growth rate about of 9% per year yeah. while the official the formal economy has a growth rate of about 1.2% And this uh, informal or black economy uh, breeds from uh, corruption, from drug smuggling, from uh, the terrorist industry uh, and other criminal activities which are conducted by different sections of the Taliban and other reactionary elements in Pakistan. And it provides about 78% uh, uh, of the total uh, jobs uh, in Pakistan. And the black economy is uh, not invested in like thing like as manufacturing industry or uh, any other long-term investments. Uh, manufacturing industry or other uh, the black economy. It doesn't invest itself in the Its main investment is in, um, in real estate, in transport, and other services sectors where it can invest and run away with its investment at the shortest possible uh, time. And this black economy, which was actually created by the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan, started to develop under the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan in the 78. <coughs> and it, 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 the drug trade and, and other methods of, uh, of raising this money have been a tradition of Americans in Honduras, in Vietnam, in all other places where they've intervened. And uh, according to one estimate, this uh, drug trade and other criminal uh, basis of this economy has an annual turnover of uh, $80 billion which is twice the total oil revenues of Saudi Arabia. And it is spread like a cancer in uh, Pakistan's uh, cap normal capitalist economy. And this cancer has grown greater, this tumor has grown greater than the body itself. It has penetrated the army, <coughs> the ISI and other uh, state agencies, which play an active role in every, uh, in every aspect of the state and society. The ISI, ISI controls and intervenes all the political parties and their decision making and policies. They have their agents on every newspaper and television network board with important positions in, in the media. And this black economy has penetrated not just the uh, politics and uh, other uh, criminal aspects of society, but it, it has also penetrated the armed forces. Even in the formal economy, the biggest entrepreneur in Pakistan is the army itself.
<coughs> and uh, this has really created a situation of this mayhem and conflict and conflagration with this black economy uh, just uh, playing a destructive role in uh, the social and economic uh, foundations of society. And the main benefactor and the protector of this uh, black economy is Islamic fundamentalism. And then there are many Islamic fundamentalisms. The Wahhabi uh, Sunni uh, fundamentalism supported by Saudi Arabia. The Shiite fundamentalism supported by uh, Iran. And several other uh, fundamentalist uh, extremist groups or neo-fascist groups that, uh, that not, not just are based on black economy but, but uh, use Islam and fundamentalism to protect the crimes of those bosses and those ma mafia uh, gangsters who actually are now dominating the politics and society in Pakistan. Now, we discussed yesterday, but uh, this question of having negotiations with Taliban and Islamic fundamentalism, uh, it's a very tricky situation in reality. <coughs> Leaving aside their own groupings and different uh, factions uh, who are in constant conflict with each other, even any group which goes into negotiations with Americans or the Pakistani state, as soon as they come to closer to an agreement or a deal, immediately they will split. And splits in Taliban and fundamentalists are not splits like we have our, in, our, in our internationals. <laughs> They're a pretty serious affair, you know. <laughs> because those who will negotiate and go uh, reach a deal, as soon as they go back, they're not anymore. Their heads of, are just cut out. But this is also a reality that Islam and Islamic fundamentalism, which is Pakistan is so famous for or notoriously famous for, have no real basis in society. The highest vote they ever got was 3.5% in the whole history of the country. It's actually the so-called liberal and secular and democratic politicians and forces which pamper fundamentalism and it's also the U.S. imperialism which uh, created and has been sustaining sections of Islamic fundamentalism. <coughs> so, I think that uh, whenever there will be a movement, uh, I don't think Islamic fundamentalism will be any real serious threat uh, or a, a serious challenge for us or for the, the working class.
Now, if you look at the economy, the formal economy, it's uh, the, uh, as I said, growth rate is about 1.2 percent. Uh, in the last five years, the Pakistani rupee depreciated by 50 percent. Uh, they're the highest budget, trade, and fiscal deficit in the country's history ever. Uh, the expenditure on health is 0.4 percent. Which is one thirty fourth in the one thirty four poorest countries in the world. Which is one thirty fourth in the one thirty four poorest countries. The last country, the lowest in the world, right? Formally, uh, the education is uh, is one point two percent. And which hardly provides any basis for uh, even public education to be delivered uh, to pe people. Sixty percent of children can never get to go to school. That's mostly female uh, students. And uh, the average growth of children in Pakistan is stunted. In the next 15 years, the new generation of the children will be one or one and a half inch shorter in their height than the previous generations. And it's also a tragedy that if they're physically stunted, they're also uh, mentally stunted. Five hundred thousand women die every year during uh, childbirth and pregnancy. Eighty-two percent of the population is forced into non-scientific medication. Eighty-two percent. Eighty-two percent are forced into non-scientific medication. The sale of kidney and other uh, human organs are some of the most flourishing trades in Pakistan. And if you look at the physical and social infrastructure, it's uh, in a state of disarray. At the time of independence, the British had built a railway line, uh, a railway infrastructure in the subcontinent. And uh, ever since partition and independence, the Pakistani ruling class has not added anything to the railway, uh, railway line. They have destroyed 27,000 kilometers of railway built by the British. So the railway is in decay. The Pakistan International Airline has uh, 46 aircraft, 32 have been grounded. BIA.
They can't even put half their fleet up in the air. The Pakistan steel mill has an annual loss of uh, about 90 billion rupees, which is enormous. Pakistan has a total capacity of uh, uh, creating uh, 23,000 megawatts of electricity. 23,000 megawatt uh, of electricity. But they produce uh, around 5,000 megawatts. This means that uh, most uh, households, especially the poor neighborhoods and in the villages, people have to live without electricity between 18 to 20 hours a day. But in the cities, uh, it, is, it is like 12 hours a day. So it's a very famous uh, uh, quote that uh, Pakistanis are the happiest people in the world. Because after every hour, they uh, rise up and jump in joy and say, Aage, Aage, it has come, it has come, the electricity has come. <laughs> and uh, if the road infrastructure, the sewage, uh, and other, all infrastructure is in a disarray, and the state has no uh, possibility under the present system to improve even the existing infrastructure, what to say of building a new infrastructure. But I think in these uh, elections that were held in May, uh, they made a very blatant mistake. <laughs> the state made a very blatant mistake in the elections. The Americans uh, actually agreed with, in a deal with the Pakistani state that the election result should be where uh, Sharif gets uh, enough votes to form a government, but not a majority to form a government. And this uh, Sharif, who's a right-wing idiot, he's really a goof, was given a majority in the elections by sections of the army who uh, actually betrayed the Americans in manipulating that result. And I think this was a very grave mistake on part of the uh, state and the ruling class. Because with such a terrible social and economic condition that prevail in Pakistan. Such a terrible suffering that is inflicted upon the masses. <coughs> I don't think it's a very <coughs> it's a very uh, serious and uh, uh, wise thing to bring a right-wing government with a record of anti-working class policies, the traditional party of the bourgeoisie, into a majority government. <coughs> 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 
because uh, the Americans in the last period have been advocating a policy of uh, reconciliation. That means coalition governments coming into power mm -hmm. so that no single party could take the blame of the crimes they have to commit to perpetuate and continue capitalism. Mm -hmm. But uh, this time also they wanted a coalition government of uh, the Muslim League, the right-wing party, which they gave a majority. Uh, Imran Khan, another uh, right-wing demagogue, uh, or right-wing populist, and some other parties, so that the blame could be shared and there could not be a collective singular target of the masses against whom they would rise and fight, and especially if it's a right-wing uh, conservative leader like Sharif. Now, in the last uh, five years, the PP government wrecked havoc uh, upon the masses. There was uh, the highest ever increase in prices in five years, more than it increased in 60 years. There were massive redundancies in unemployment. Electricity, uh, electricity shortages became a daily routine and a curse for the masses. <laughs> Corruption was so rampant that it has never been before in such a corrupt country uh, with, uh, like Pakistan. And that was mainly because uh, the PPP came at the end of a movement which was, uh, which was crushed or which was defeated by assassinating Benazir who was the central point or the point of reference of that upsurge in 2007. And uh, the, her, her husband, uh, who was famous for his corruption and crime and everything, became the president and led the party. <coughs> and Zardari and his cronies who were in the leadership of the PUP were so cruelly indifferent to the people or the party or politics that they just did not consider anything and went on with all the crime and corruption to an extent unforeseen in Pakistan. And hence the vote of, uh, in, in the elections in May this year was not a vote for hope. It was a vote in desperation of the people who had no, didn't know what to do. So they voted Sharif uh, just to, to, to vent their anger against uh, the PP leadership. And in this, this condition, uh, for us to work in the PPP was simply not possible. There was nothing in the PPP to work in. Where would it work?
Whatever was left in the PP from top to bottom, the whole structures of the party or the individuals who were in that party were all drenched in, in, in a nauseating orgy of corruption. So, uh, we were also blocked from entering the party, but there was nothing to enter in the party anyway. So, in the whole period, we had to uh, go for independent work. <coughs> and without changing our slogan or our title in the paper as a socialist voice in the PPP, uh, we had to come out in opposition of the Zardari leadership and this corrupt whole uh, crony bureaucracy that was uh, dominating the party. And this uh, PP bureaucracy uh, uh, and the government, they carried through some of the most vicious recipes of the IMF and the World Bank, like privatization, deregulation, uh, restructuring, liberalization, <laughs> and other similar uh, anti-worker policies. And... Uh, our organization, what we have now uh, come to the conclusion and we have researched and we have investigated, was attacked in 2008, not by Zardari, not by the PPP government, but uh, by the ISI itself. It was ISI who had bought up Manzoor Ahmed uh, to betray us. Yeah. The ISI is the Interest Services Intelligence Agency. <coughs> which runs uh, smuggling gangs, drug trade, Islamic fundamentalism, Taliban. And uh, the Americans are even terrified of the ISI. They created it and now they are terrified of it. So now we have a real uh, solid evidence that uh, it was ISI who attacked us uh, in uh, 2008 to destroy the organization from within. And uh, actually, you know, if we did not have had that attack at that moment in time, we would not have been as strong an organization as we are now to face the other attacks that have been coming in the last period. That attack had put every comrade individually and the organization collectively into a test of uh, a lifetime where you have to make a decision either to fight and stand till the end or to give up to the pressures and the attacks and uh, other, uh, 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 other uh, methodologies of the ruling class to destroy you. And uh, when uh, this year, when Fred was going to Pakistan, I told Fred in January that uh, five years ago, when you went to Pakistan, the organization you saw is not there anymore. It's another organization.
And uh, so in the last five years, uh, there has not been much of strikes or struggles or big movement. There have been scattered uh, up, up, uprisings in different parts of the country. And uh, there have been five major struggles in the trade union field, in the, uh, in the industrial plane. <coughs> Two were lost and three were won. The struggle of the Pakistan telecommunication workers was defeated because we had a very little presence in, that, in the leadership of that struggle. <laughs> Similarly, the, uh, the struggle of uh, the railway workers also against privatization of certain sections and redundancies also was defeated uh, because the leadership was not strong enough or didn't have a revolutionary basis to really take the struggle to, uh, uh, to its conclusion. <coughs> but there were three major struggles which were victorious. First was uh, the struggle of the Pakistan International Airlines, the PIA workers. And the PIA had a union which was the union of the PPP itself, the, the stooges of the PPP leadership. <laughs> And the struggle which started from below was not just a struggle against the regime and the government and the bureaucracy, but it, it was also a struggle that had to cut through the existent uh, uh, trade union leadership that was controlled and uh, was a uh, psychophants of the uh, Zardari government. And in uh, the main cities, most public meetings, it were our comrades who led that struggle and gave the, uh, the workers a moral support and gave them enough determination that this struggle could be won, it could be fought if against the government, against the regime, against the state, and also against the union that controls the workers that, that was elected by the workers and the workers had to fight and pierce through the union bureaucracy to win that struggle. And through that victory, we were able to stop anybody being uh, fired from the PIA. And uh, the privatization of the airline. And what uh, the PPP stood for, and all those uh, are enemies who are opposed as Marxists and are still this uh, opportunists of the world unite uh, theory, they are getting into it. They were carrying or advocating the policy of PPP, public-private partnership. <laughs> I don't understand what kind of maxim is that is, but anyway. The other struggle was uh, the struggle of the uh, Karachi Electric Supply Corporation, that is the electric work, electricity workers in Karachi. <laughs> and, 
And again here, during the elections of the union of the Karachi Electric Supply Workers, there was two unions, one supported by our organization, the other supported by the PPP, by the MQM, MQM by the Islamic fundamentalist Jamaat Islami, and all other parties uh, supporting the other union when the elections took place in 2008, the 2009. And the first uh, triumph we had was that those uh, workers supported by our comrades against all the political parties won that uh, union election and became the CBA, the Collective Bargaining Agents. <coughs> and in, in, uh, during those elections, and even before that, the regime, PPP regime had been able to privatize the Karachi electric supply. But after its privatization, there was, there was a plan of massive uh, redundancies and firing of the workers. And from there on, uh, a strike erupted, or just came up, which continued in, with a sit-in uh, around that uh, electric electricity uh, uh, center uh, or headquarters uh, for 33 days. And when I went to Karachi, uh, some of those older veteran workers who had known me uh, from the past, he said, what kind of people you have sent here? They have fired up the workers and now workers are not going to uh, withdraw, or not, not going to retreat at all. They are not going to fight to the finish. And ultimately, after 33 days of constant struggle, sit in and strikes, we won that uh, strike, and no worker was made redundant at that time. But uh, from our organizational point of view, the most important victory was the victory of the Young Doctors Association. Now, obviously, even in Europe, there is some sort of this thing about doctors and engineers and technocrats, you know, having a certain social status a bit above the general people, you know. But in colonial countries, in a country like Pakistan, a doctor is not called a doctor. He's called a doctor Saab. And Saab is a colonial term which was used for the British colonialists who existed, who ruled the subcontinent for 200 years. So all those Dr. Saabs who were getting a very low salary and were young <laughs> had ultimately to come, had to come to their basis of realities of economics and society. So we formed the Young Doctors Association. It was it started in Lahore in Punjab. 
and after the demands were refused and rejected by the government, uh, they immediately went on strike. But it was a very well organized and a disciplined strike. Those doctors who were on duty in uh, emergency and other uh, such uh, life-saving areas of the hospitals kept on working and the general uh, OPD, the outpatient department, other departments were closed. But even the surgeons were on alert and on duty and we ensured that uh, uh, nobody suffers or nobody is killed, uh, no patient dies because of the strike. But it was not just the government, it was the media, the intelligentsia and everybody who attacked the doctors viciously, the young doctors. <coughs> but uh, the, uh, our uh, two comrades who were there to, uh, who started this whole struggle or organized the doctors into this YDA were very clear on the fundamental issue of training the doctors to understand that they are not above and over the working class in general. And if they have to fight it, they have to fight it with the support of the proletariat. And if they have to get the support of the proletariat, they'll have to have respect and uh, attitude that the proletariat can support them and uh, have an equal, uh, have a psychology of equality with the working class, not over and above the working class. But the police were really vicious and brutal. They attacked the doctors' hostels. And even they beat up and brutally injured those doctors who were only there for the emergency uh, duty, sitting in the emergency wards of the hospitals. So the first wave of strike was repressed and crushed by the state. But in that process, we had gained more support and more contacts within the young doctors who were striking, not just against the government, but also against the senior doctors, the professors who were earning billions. And these young doctors were giving pe given peanuts. <laughs> And those rich doctors paid the media to, uh, to whip up a venomous campaign against the young doctors that they are serial killers, they are killing people and they wanted some child or some old woman <coughs> or some person to die and then use that death to defame the doctors and to defame the strike. But ultimately, uh, when we have mobilized other unions to come and support uh, the doctor, the movement started to uh, take off. Yeah. 
then uh, other parties like Imran Khan and the PPP and all parties, uh, so-called opposition parties in Punjab, came to support the doctors. But the doctors, young doctors' leadership clearly said that nobody else is allowed to take our rostrum, to take our podium, except the PTUDC who have fought with us in thick and thin through all the difficulties. So we reject all other political parties. Only the PTUDC will speak and will lead this movement. But with that consistent and persistent struggle, the strike spread not just from Lahore to all other cities of Punjab, but throughout Pakistan, in Quetta, in Karachi, in Peshawar, everywhere the young doctors were out for the struggle as they got the inspiration of the strike which uh, we were leading. And so as the strike spread, it became more uh, intense. The re regime had to budge and had to accept all the demands that the doctors' movement had posed. <laughs> But in these last five years, there has not has been any real serious struggle of the workers. It may be in the railways, in the electricity department, in the postal workers, in uh, the uni labor and other multinationals. in which the comrades uh, have not participated. And through that, we have been able to recruit quite a substantial number of uh, workers uh, from these struggles. <coughs> For example, in Lahore, we have recruited now about Maybe no, it's more, I don't know. But at least 28 doctors in Lahore were recruited as full members of the organization. So every major hospital now has a branch of our organization. <laughs> and those branches are named after the hospitals. This is Mayo Hospital branch, this is Services Hospital branch, <laughs> something like that. And one of the benefits uh, of this uh, struggle has been that now all our comrades and their families get, to get a free treatment of uh, all diseases and sicknesses, which is very expensive, uh, expensive otherwise. You know. Now, on the parliamentary work, if we look at it in this uh, year's elections, we had a session in the Congress on the role of Marxists in bourgeois parliaments. And uh, what we discussed was that uh, we should have those comrades who have real positions and serious chance of winning the elections, we should put, up, put them up as candidates. So we decided to put up five candidates for the parliamentary elections. 
the four of them, uh, Comrade Ilyas Khan, Comrade Riyaz Lund, Comrade uh, Gufran Ahad, and Comrade Kamar, uh, were supposed to get PPP tickets for, uh, to contest the election from a PPP platform. And at the Congress, we had clearly put the position that we might win all the seats or we might not win even a single seat, but that won't make any fundamental difference to our work, our strategy, and our moving for movement forward. Fortunately, we did not get any ticket of the PVP. Because if we were uh, got the ticket, and such was a ferocious backlash against the PVP because of its criminal policies of five years, that it was just washed out, especially in Punjab, where most of our candidates were. <laughs> and if we would have stood up and we would have lost, uh, we just couldn't have said, no, we lost because of the PPP. So, I mean, so it saved our comrades from this humiliation and defeat. But one candidate we had to put up in any case, that was Comrade Ali Wazir, about whom I discussed yesterday, from Waziristan. But in any case, during the campaign, the comrades had a high profile in, in intervention, and uh, these five candidates, comrades, have uh, mentioned uh, in the coming periods, they've got big impacts in their regions, in their constituencies, and they are mass leaders in, in themselves uh, on the political forum in Pakistan. Now, amongst the youth, we have two sort of uh, uh, platforms of work. And we are very flexible about the strategy and methods and tactics of youth work. And in different regions and areas, we have different methods of work, uh, different platforms of youth work through which we move forward. Uh, we, we, some of our youth work in the, is in the PSF, which is very little, the PVP students wing. In large areas, we have uh, work uh, under the unemployed youth uh, campaign uh, movement. It's sort of a frontal organization we use to recruit the unemployed youth. In Kashmir, we work with the JKNSF, the, the traditional youth organization uh, of the Kashmiri youth which we have taken over about a decade ago. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, in the universities and colleges in general, we work in this, amongst the students. We work in the Pakistan Students uh, Pro Pro Progressive Students Alliance. And youth is about 70% uh, or 75% of the organization. And in the top leadership, in the EC or CS, what, what we call it, the main leadership is comprised of young comrades who are very dedicated, politically very advanced and developed. Now, one of the weakest uh, aspects of our work is the women's work. Uh, Pakistan is a very bad society for women. On one hand, this is this Islamic obscurantism which represses women in their homes and in society in general. <coughs> On the other hand, these liberal and petty bourgeois women and feminists, you know, they are all building different NGOs which corrupts women who want to take political uh, part uh, in society. Uh, but still, in spite of all this, this is our weakness and we have to overcome it. And now we are taking up a young female full-timer which will uh, not only uh, do the other parts of the organizational work, but also be in charge of the women's work in general. And it, sh it will be on the agenda on every meeting of the EC uh, as a priority uh, issue. At a certain stage, when our internal work reaches a certain organized capacity, we will we are discussing of uh, setting up a women's front, or like a revolutionary women's front, or something like that, to attract more women into an organization which is based on revolutionary women. In this uh, whole period. Uh, the organization has, in spite of the difficulties, uh, developed enormously uh, on a quality, not so much on a quantitative basis, but more on a qualitative basis. The holding of Marxist <coughs> schools is an uh, ongoing affair throughout the year. It is a regular program with, through which all the schools are held at uh, regular intervals. We have area Marxist schools on a monthly basis. We have uh, regional Marxist schools on a quarterly basis. And we have two national Marxist schools, a summer Marxist school in the north in the Himalayas and a winter Marxist school in the south in the desert. And uh, the organization is now quite well known in the country. Uh, 
uh, on a question of our uh, party line, we can't in a country where about 80% uh, of the population has no access to computer or internet, still the print media plays an important role. So we have been able to produce, produce uh, or we are able to get published uh, three articles every week uh, in the mainstream paper, which uh, Urdu paper, which comes out simultaneously from nine cities in Pakistan and has a circulation of about uh, uh, half a million, a bit less. And, uh, you know, they pay for those articles, the boards. And through the amounts raised from those articles, we, are a we were able to take two more full-timers for the organization. And, you know, these bourgeois newspaper owners like Murdoch, they are real, you know, uh, no. <laughs> they're very mean, you know, really mean and greedy. They don't give a dime away uh, unless they've got something coming out of it. So this means that if they are paying us to write our articles, and this means that Marxism is selling as a commodity in Pakistan. <laughs> and uh, over and above that, our advantage is that we have an organization spread out throughout the country. It's very difficult communications, far off areas, thousands of miles of distances. And our comrades get the but the Stalinists used to call the party line every th th thrice a day, uh, thrice a week uh, through the bourgeois press. Then we are also comrades in the music industry. <coughs> Film actors and uh, people who are uh, known celebrities in different uh, parts of the country. So uh, I think uh, just to conclude comrades, uh, there have been attempts of different left groups and sects to form a Syriza in Pakistan. Well, PPP has collapsed, but it has not collapsed uh, to the level of Pasok as yet. But it still can collapse as a tradition. And I think uh, I would like the IS Congress to come on this because uh, we still maintain the orientation toward the PPP, but uh, at, the, at the same time, uh, there is, there is no, not much or n almost nothing to work in the PPP at this point. There has been splits and uh, conflicts in the PPP which have increased after uh, the loss from power.
But none of those splits are uh, political. They don't have any serious uh, economic or pro programmatic differences. And while outside the P, all the left got together and formed a party. Just a few weeks before our Congress, they had a Congress. Our Congress was in the main hall, which is one of the largest halls in Pakistan. With about 2,800 people attending that our Congress. And all these 18 parties who got together to form a bigger party, they had a Congress in the basement of that hall with 250 people. <laughs> So I don't think there's a, a serious uh, analogy of si any Syriza developing in Pakistan. And such is the crucial stage for the organization that at the moment when there is no alternative to the PPP on the left, the only alternative possible is our own tendency rising up to the challenge to become an alternative uh, of the mass party. And from that you can imagine that in the most atrocious conditions probably in the world that prevail now in Pakistan, we have uh, such an urgency of a task to develop an, as an alternative to the traditional party of the masses. But we have existed, we have grown in perhaps the most difficult of the objective conditions. No communist party or left party has ever had such a strength, such a uh, qualitative and qualitative, quantitative quality than what we have built in Pakistan? Never, not even the Stalinists, not even the most, no, nobody ever did it. And in these last uh, two or three decades when we did it, all comrades in Pakistan are convinced that we could do it because we were the part of this international, part of the IMT. Thank you. Both.